Okay, Dr. Golden, you may begin. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's really a pleasure to have you join us, although we're all looking forward to the day when we can get together safely uh, in person rather than virtually. I'm Bob Golden. I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I'm also Vice Chancellor for Medical Affairs and serve as Chair of the Board of UW Health, our academic health system. But my passion is in my side gig, which is uh, my engagement with the AAHC, where currently I have the privilege of serving as the uh, past chair of the uh, board of directors. Well, uh, this is a real special um, honor uh, for me. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce the facilitator of the 2021 AAHC Sullivan Alliance Lecture. Uh, and that is the Sullivan Alliance's namesake uh, an icon in our field, Dr. Lewis Sullivan. As you know, Dr. Sullivan served as the uh, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and also has served with distinction as the President of Morehouse School of Medicine. So it is a uh, pleasure to turn the virtual podium over to Dr. Sullivan, who will introduce today's speaker. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Golden. It certainly my pleasure to greet all of you and thank you for your participation in this annual meeting of the AAHC. I do have the distinct honor of introducing this year's Sullivan uh, uh, lecturer. This is the second lecture uh, given. It was my pleasure to begin this series last year uh, as the lecturer. And this year we have an even uh, greater distinction of introducing to you Dr. Wayne Riley. Dr. Riley, as you know, is president of the State University of New York Medical Center in Downstate in Brooklyn. He was born in New Orleans, grew up there. His father was a physician. Uh, he uh, attended Yale uh, undergraduate school. Uh, he then uh, became uh, a part of uh, Mayor Moriarty's uh, staff, serving as chief of staff before coming on to medical school. He came to Morehouse School of Medicine where he graduated uh, in 1993 as president of the student government and president of his class. When I returned from Washington in 1993 from, following the conclusion of my tenure as secretary is when I first met uh, our senior student, Wayne Riley. I was quite impressed with him then and his career has shown that I was correct in my impressions, because he went on to Baylor Medical Center for his training in internal medicine. Following the completion of that, he became vice dean and vice president for governmental affairs at Baylor a College of Medicine, where he served with distinction and also as assistant uh, chief of medicine at the Bentaub uh, Hospital there in, Clute, in Houston. He then went on to Meharry Medical College as president uh, in 2003. And during his tenure there, he established a health policy center uh, with great distinction. When he completed his tenure at Meharry, he then became president of the American College of Physicians. And again, had an outstanding tenure leading that uh, Association of American Physicians. When he completed uh, his tenure, there, he then accepted the presidency of Downstate uh, Medical Center. He has been very active uh, with COVID pandemic uh, at his medical center for the past uh, 18 months or so. But in addition to providing leadership there, he's become pre president of the New York Academy of Medicine. He was a recent recipient of the humanitarian award from the Golden uh, Society but this is one of many awards that he has received during his uh, career. So it is with great pleasure that I indeed present to you the man of many talents, much achievement, an outstanding physician, leader, and administrator, Dr. Wayne Riley. Well, great. Good morning, all. Uh, what an honor it is to uh, give this Sullivan Lecture uh, following up upon uh, the work of my uh, wonderful life mentor and friend, uh, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who we all admired 
as one of the icons of uh, healthcare, health equity, higher education uh, in the United States. And he truly is one of the greatest Americans of our lifetime. So Lou, thank you uh, for your generous introduction. I am um, a proud graduate of the Morehouse School of Medicine after attending Yale and getting a master's degree at Tulane. Uh, and it was a very transformative experience uh, to uh, study medicine in, in the house that Lou built, as we called it. And as Lou will uh, just mentioned, I was a senior class president uh, when he returned uh, to uh, Morehouse School of Medicine to resume the presidency. Um, but first I wanna pay tribute to Lou. <clears throat> These are some photographs from his illustrious history that I think are very emblematic of the man. Uh, you see a picture of him uh, in the president's private study uh, in the White House, just off from the Oval Office. He's uh, uh, chatting with uh, President George H.W. Bush. And uh, I, Lou and I talk about this all the time. George H.W. Bush, although he was a one-term president, didn't get enough credit for some of the things he did in terms of health. And Lou was the architect of some of that. Uh, matter of fact, I tell people all the time, anytime you go into a grocery store and you pick up a, a product and you look at the food label, it was Lou Sullivan who had to, to appeal to then President H.W. Bush over the objections of the Secretary of the Agriculture to have food labels placed on, uh, on uh, groceries in the United States. The ADA, the American with Disabilities Act, came under George H.W. Bush's uh, tenure and Lou's tenure as secretary. Uh, the, the initial efforts at uh, NIH for an Office of Women's Health, Office of Minority Health, um, the better AIDS uh, coordination, and you see a picture of him uh, as secretary right behind uh, Tony Fauci and to his right, Jim Mason, who was the, then the assistant secretary for health. Uh, Lou was right there rolling up his sleeves working on AIDS policy back uh, when he was secretary. And then there's a great picture he with uh, Mr. Stokes, uh, the Honorable Carl Stokes, uh, Louis Stokes rather, uh, the Congressman from uh, Cleveland who was known as Mr. Minority Health and has a building named after him at NIH. So, these are just a few snippets uh, of the man in action that I think are emblematic of him. You see him testifying before Congress as secretary, and then more recently uh, speaking on C-SPAN uh, in a program with other uh, former uh, secretaries of health and human services. So this is, this is the wonderful man that we're saluting by this lecture. So Lou, uh, thank you for what you've done for the country and for all of us and for healthcare in general. Now, as Lou said, I was a, a young, uh, uh, soon to be physician when he returned to Atlanta in January of 1993, my senior year. And uh, I was the senior class president and also president of the student body when he returned. And so one of the tasks at the graduation is to meet our graduation speaker. So here's a great picture I keep here in my office uh, here in Brooklyn of me and uh, then President Sullivan and our distinguished commencement speaker, Anglican Archbishop Desmond Tutu. So that was a very uh, wonderful moment in my life where I got to participate in, in our commencement as, as the class speaker, but also to welcome uh, you know, a world icon, uh, uh, Bishop Tutu along with Lou. So I cherish this photograph. Um, now, uh, the, the context for this talk is trying to improve the culture of health. And I think when I thought about this whole uh, topic, uh, something came to mind that, that I think we all have heard about. And that is the great quote by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, who said in 1966, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. And many times we hear this quote, and, but it's, I think it sets the table for my presentation today uh, as the Sullivan lecturer, because again, Dr. King's very simple syllogism is, is sort of a call to action even today in 2021 as we work on health care to try to improve the culture of health in our country. Uh, now, again, Dr. King was no stranger to, you know, challenges to his life. As you know, he, as we all know, he was unfortunately taken from us way too soon, uh, assassinated in 1968 in April, but that wasn't his first brush with somebody trying to kill him. Uh, you know, back in the early 60s, uh, he was at a, a store in Harlem signing one of his books, and a woman stabbed him with a letter opener. 
Uh, and Dr. King used to joke for the rest of his life that he was a sneeze away from death because that letter opener was just touching his aorta. Uh, and the surgeons had told him, Dr. King, if you had sneezed, that, that letter opener would have punctured your aorta and you would have uh, met your death. Um, but when he was asked about this, he really did put in context how we have to think about the culture of health because he responded, he said, look, I felt no ill will towards Mrs. Isola Curry, that is the mentally ill woman who stabbed him, and know that thoughtful people will do all in their power to see that she gets the help she apparently needs if she is to become a free and constructive member of society. Uh, if there's a Kingian philosophy of healthcare, it's embodied in, in those two uh, quotes from Dr. King, his own experience with with uh, uh, being almost assassinated prior to his assassination. And then his words about the injustice in the inhuman aspects of healthcare and its injustice and its unfairness to many Americans. Now, again, when Dr. King was alive and active, you know, we take for granted today some things that uh, just don't seem to, to square with our modern day reality. But in 1963, Again, this country was rigidly segregated. And here, you know, and I show this to medical students because they are incredulous. Um, here's a group of not only black, but also white physicians picketing at the American Medical Association against segregated healthcare facilities in the country. Think about this, physicians picketing at the AMA meeting in Atlantic City. Um, but this was the tenor of the times, obviously, in terms of healthcare back in the 60s then again informs our efforts even to this day to approach our work to try to change and improve the culture of healthcare for all Americans. Now, again, anytime I give a talk on health disparities or health inequity, I always, it is rare that I don't include a slide that talks about this seminal report that it was put out in 1985, I believe, by then uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Margaret Heckler, and it became known to all of us colloquially as the Heckler Report. Uh, also, Tom Malone, who's a great PhD, worked, uh, worked on the report with the secretary. But this was the first time, colleagues, that the United States government put out an official declaration that we have a problem with Black and minority health. And um, this report really was catalytic to many of the things that Lou was able to do as secretary, catalytic to a number of initiatives that uh, then took forth from the federal government in terms of HRSA, uh, Title VII, uh, trying to increase the pipeline programs for, for health professionals, et cetera. So again, uh, Secretary Heckler, I think owes, uh, we're, we, she passed away a few years ago, but she did a yeoman service by putting out this report. Now remember, she was the Secretary of Health and Human Services under Ronald Reagan. President Reagan was not known to be um, embracing of a lot of initiatives that uh, would be considered in the realm of social justice or civil rights or whatever. But she put it out and it laid bare that we have problems in the United States with minority health access, quality, et cetera. So those of you who've never seen the Heckler Report, it's, it's still a great read, but it really does set the table uh, for a number of things that have emanated since that time. Now, again, we start with the definition of health disparities. These are three that I particularly like. Um, one definition that came forth from the Health Policy Institute of Ohio refers to gaps in the quality of healthcare, healthcare across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. HRSA defined it as, as the population-specific differences in the presence of disease outcomes or access to healthcare. The Institute of Medicine defined it as racial, excuse me, um, uh, racial or ethnic differences in the quality of healthcare that are not due to access related factors or clinical needs, preferences, and appropriateness of intervention. So you can see these definitions of health disparities converge and diverge a little bit. And they're instructive in terms of understanding how we have to, again, think about health disparities as we seek a culture of health equity in our country. Now, why are you know, what's the big deal about healthcare disparities? I was given this lecture once and somebody said, Dr. I, you know, I hear this all the time, but what's the big deal? Well, the big deal colleagues is um, they have pr a profound impact on 
on our country in several ways. And I would argue one is that they pose significant moral and ethical dilemmas for our nation. We've seen that during the COVID epidemic. Secondly, it pits healthcare as a resource that is tied to social justice, opportunity, and quality of life for individuals and groups. And I'll talk about this a little later. Third, it ties the productivity of the nation's economy to the health status of its citizens. Next, it exacerbates rising healthcare costs when healthcare is inadequate or poor. And I would also argue it provides clear implications for the overall quality of care we all experience, whether we're minority or non-minority. Now, again, a difficult construct to, uh, to lay bare, but uh, this comes from unequal treatment at the uh, seminal report from the Institute of Medicine in 2001, which, which uh, tried to develop an integrated model of how health disparities can be thought through. And you can see that clinically disparate uh, healthcare decisions on the right uh, are really a cascade of things that happen in the patient encounter, in the data interpretation, interpretation that we all use as physicians and healthcare providers. Then it's suffused with uh, a sort of a subjectivity in terms of the interpretation. Um, and more worrisome, uh, as has been well studied, is the issue of conscious and unconscious bias and prejudice that then leads to stereotyping that then converges to result at times in significant health care disparities. So from a, a sort of a graphical visual uh, thing to look at in terms of how do we explain health disparities, I think this still, even though it came out in 2001, is fairly uh, helpful to help us think through how do health disparities occur and how do we address this in order to better have a better culture of health equity. Now, again, this is also from an unequal treatment. It again, it looks at the dimensions in terms of quality, the, the minority population and the non-minority population in terms of how there's a gap in quality. And again, it goes back to some of the things I just said. Uh, there's a difference, a discrepancy, a gap uh, that minority Americans experience because of clinical appropriates and need and patient preference. Uh, a big aspect is the operation of our very complicated healthcare systems, the legal and regulatory and economic climate in which healthcare exists, the ecosystem of healthcare as I call it. And then again, the, the, uh, uh, the acknowledged discrimination, bias, stereotyping, uncertainty that then leads to disparity uh, as indicated here. So again, another way to think about it in terms of the quality and continuum of care that again, makes us understand, have a better clarity around why health disparities exist. Now, again, if you look at uh, more recent data, um, this, this comes from the Commonwealth Fund. They do an excellent job of, of providing excellent data on all things related to healthcare disparities. But here, if you look at uh, you know, the whole issue that uh, uh, Tom Leviste, uh, at, at then at Hopkins, now at Tulane, once said that health disparities are not so much about race as place. And there's some wisdom to that. I don't fully subscribe to that, but I think there is a large proportion, a large quotient. It depends on where you live. And so if you look at the population patterns of our country, you can see that most non-minority Americans tend to cluster in the Northeast and the upper Midwest, central Midwest. Uh, black Americans tend to cluster along the, uh, the, uh, the uh, South Carolina and North Carolina coast, a little bit here in the Northeast, but heavily in the South, where Lou and I are from. Uh, run, you can run your finger from the Virginia uh, DC line all the way across to central uh, uh, Louisiana, uh, uh, Northern uh, uh, Arkansas, Southeast, Southwestern, Tennessee, that's the bulk of the black population in the United States is in that green area. And then of course the Latino, the Latinx and Hispanic populations clustered in some respects along the Eastern seaboard, but heavily in the West Coast, California, heavily in Southeastern Texas um, and uh, New Mexico and also South Florida. So again, that's understanding the demography of our country is, is really important. And I tell this to the students, both public health and the healthcare types, look, you got to understand 
demography is destiny in terms of healthcare. Uh, so it makes, it makes perfect sense that we pay attention to the demography of our country as we think about improving the culture of its healthcare. Again, um, you know, the, the statistics are sobering in terms of the percent of 18 year olds and older who went without care because of cost between 2011 and 2019. And this is even in spite of the arrival of the Affordable Care Act, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. But you can see we still have we still have issues uh, in terms of of access in terms in Latinx and Hispanic populations in terms of who went without care. That obviously deserves all of our attention among our Latin and Hispanic um, uh, fellow citizens. That the gap in not seeking care can be a significant uh, contributor to a lack of of health equity in our country. Uh, further, uh, if you look at uh, uh, where the, uh, the clusters of percent of adults 18 and older who went without care because of cost. And you look at among all Americans and you can see uh, that the darker bluer areas uh, uh, on the, these, two, uh, these three maps in the United States tend to indicate where there are populations that have gone more without care than others. And so again, understanding the place where our fellow citizens li live can tell us a lot about their health status. Um, and again, this is uh, something that uh, we have uh, sort of come lately to understand in terms of the overall health issue and the culture of health in our country. Um, when we look at percent of adults age 18 and older with a, who, with a dental visit in the past year, um, Dr. Sullivan has been a big proponent of oral health and the dental profession and the dental therapist uh, initiative uh, that he uh, uh, coined uh, as a chair of the Sullivan Alliance because of the lack of dental care in many parts of the country, particularly in South and Latino and African-American communities. So here it is, uh, Black and Latinos tend to lag the rest of the population in their ability to visit a dentist. Uh, and again, oral health obviously is critically important to the health of the entire person. Uh, percent of adults 18 and older with any mental illness who received mental health services in the past year of 2019. Again, a gaps again, um, almost one quarter less access to mental health services among Black and Latino Americans than others. Again, we know that we're in the midst uh, or the prolongation rather of a mental health crisis that involves not just substance abuse and opioids and fentanyl, but in other mental health conditions, schizophrenia, uh, severe depression, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder. So this, is, this, this data encapsulates the challenge we still have uh, to address mental health in order to get to that healthier culture of health equity. Percent of adults 18 to 64 who report being in fair or poor condition. Again, self-reported by Americans. And again, a higher percentages of our Black and Latinx Hispanic uh, citizens report not, their perception is that their health is only fair or poor. Uh, and again, it does beg the question how we can uh, assist people to have a better uh, self-reporting, obviously of their health, it's tied into all the things that we know has to happen in terms of improving the health status of the nation. Um, average life expectancy at birth. Uh, this it was a good news story up until COVID, colleagues. Uh, as you, you, the lower line, I'm sorry the, the numbers washed out, but I have that little hatch line to indicate that there's been a significant drop off in black life expectancy. It dropped from, we had gotten it up to close to 75% uh, pre-COVID and has now dropped to 72%. Uh, after closing, as beginning to close the gap that has existed ever time, ever since records have been kept on Black Americans, there's always been a life expectancy gap. But as you can see, between principally between 1990 and and up to the pandemic, we had made significant progress in closing that gap. Uh, unfortunately, there's been a, a drop in life expectancy for all Americans, but the drop has been more precipitous, as you can see by the hatch line. Uh, among African Americans due to COVID. Again, a challenge as we seek more a culture of health equity in the country that we know the adverse impact 
that, that COVID has had on both black and brown communities all over the nation. And it's now reflected in this life expectancy table. Um, another issue, uh, why giving birth in the U.S. is surprisingly deadly, deadly. This really startled me. The National Geographic magazine, um, who we all are very familiar with, this was one of their lead stories a few years back. And it struck me, the National, the, the National Geographic magazine highlighted that we have a problem with Black maternal mortality, that Black mothers are particularly at risk and, and better basic care could help uh, deal with this situation. So again, another headwind to us improving the culture of health is that we've got to get a handle on this maternal uh, 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 death and maternal care situation. Here's rip from the headlines. Someone we all know and admire is one of the greatest athletes of our lifetime, uh, Serena Williams. She almost died uh, postpartum uh, because of uh, the, the uh, way that her caregivers didn't listen to her complaints. Um, it was well known that she had had uh, an issue with uh, clots during her professional career. Uh, and again, the caregivers were somewhat dismissive of her, of her protestations uh, when she started to know uh, that her own body wasn't reacting. And she spent six weeks postpartum after delivering her child. Again, if it can happen, to a Serena Williams, what do you think happens to a mother, a black mother in inner city Baltimore, inner city New Orleans, Atlanta, Georgia, not even low income black women. This happens in black women who have degrees, who have high socioeconomic status. It, it appears that maternal mortality does, uh, takes place irrespective of whether you have a degree or you don't or you own a home, or you do, or you have high income, or you don't. Again, this health disparity is another issue we have to embrace and get our arms around as a nation in order to create that more equitable health culture that we seek. Uh, here it is, the data. Deaths in the first year of life per 1,000 births by state. And you can see the number of states that have issues with maternal mortality. And remember the first uh, states I showed you that uh, there's certain parts of the country where there's not a whole lot of, of African-American population, but yet where, wherever African-Americans are, there's a problem with maternal mortality and morbidity as evidenced by that middle uh, map of the United States. Again, a call for us all to think about how we can encourage better care of women of childbearing age, both black, Latino, uh, and others because this is a clear and present danger to our ability to create that culture of health we all seek. Again, African-American women are four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth, regardless of socioeconomic class, education, as I said, as compared to their white colleagues. Um, again, this is a sobering and we must, must embrace any efforts we can to address uh, this burden on our healthcare system, our burden on the black community in terms of mothers and babies dying prematurely. Now, strategies to eliminate health disparities as we seek that culture of health equity. Uh, again, this comes from uh, the Institute of Medicine and it's again, a graphical representation of something we all know, the social determinants of health, that our health status is tied to income, housing, not just access to health services, but employment, education, transportation, the social environment, whether you live in a community that has been ravaged by environmental injustice and pollution and poor air quality, poor water quality, uh, public safety. We know the issues, uh, again, of last summer in terms of public safety after the murder of George Floyd, the difficulty that many Black and minority communities experience with their respective police departments in terms of police misconduct, et cetera. And then again, the physical environment. These are critically important that we understand fully that they are truly the, the, the drivers and, and where we can focus our strategies to make health equity a shared vision amongst us all, to create healthier communities for individuals for, and families to live, work, and play that we foster multi-sector collaboration, that we get out of our silos 
it's not just the responsibility of government. It's not just the responsibility of uh, academic health centers that we all are uh, work in and lead. It's the responsibility of all. I refer to it as an all hands on deck approach that we need to eliminate healthcare disparities. Now, again, we've had progress away from disparity. And I think one of the best things that's happened in our professional lifetime at minimum is the fact that the Affordable Care Act came under uh, existence under uh, President Barack H. Obama. Uh, this again has been a significant contributor to decreasing levels of disparity. Even the president uh, will say, and I had that wonderful honor of going to the White House three times as we tried to get the Affordable Care Act uh, through the Congress uh, back during the president's first term. And I distinctly remember him saying in a meeting in the Rose Garden of about 150 physician leaders from around the country, he said, doctors, this bill isn't perfect, but it'll get us started on, on working on access and disparities. And unfortunately, you know, he fully expected that the Congress would revisit the health care, the Affordable Care Act to fine tune it and improve it, enhance it. And obviously, as you know, we've been through a decade long effort that is now pretty much completed with a Supreme Court decision to, to dismantle, to undermine uh, the, the progress of the Affordable Care Act. So again, I think it represents the most significant, uh, you know, uh, health policy legislation since the passage of Medicare and Medicaid. And again, it, did it does have and has had an, an amazing ability to decrease the levels of uninsurance uh, for many Americans. So again, we, need to, we don't give President Obama enough credit for the Affordable Care Act and what it has done to decrease disparities. Um, here's the impact of, of, of the Affordable Care Act in the New York Times a few years back. I, I love graphical things where you could see it. Um, in 2013, uh, much of the country was purple. That's levels of uninsurance. And then by 2016, you can see that that level of purple began to dissipate significantly. Again, progress uh, in, in addressing the lack of health insurance. Um, we still have that problem, but think of where we would be but for passage of the Affordable Care Act uh, back during President Obama's tenure, during now, during COVID, we would be in more in a world of hurt as a nation in terms of trying to get that culture of health equity uh, than we are even today. So again, kudos to the, uh, the Affordable Care Act and what his, the changes it has ushered in. The other part of disparity is, is um, you know, the lack of representation of, uh, of a diverse workforce. This has been Lou's lifelong passion uh, to diversify uh, the health professions. Um, he has, has been just uh, uh, incessant on this. The whole existence of the Sullivan Alliance was started because Lou felt that we had not been uh, strong enough in trying to address diversity of the healthcare workforce. And again, here it is, uh, New York Times had a story a few years back, the secret to keeping black men healthy is maybe black doctors. And what they're talking about is there is a race concordance data that suggests the black patients with black physicians, they are getting proper preventive medicine. Uh, they're able to talk about their issues, their approach avoidance. And again, this is not the only solution. And I tell medical students, whether you're white, black, brown, or whatever, any physician for a black American is better than no physician. But we do know we have to do better in terms of black and Latino physicians. Um, again, 5% of the population, uh, excuse me, 5% of our nation's physicians are black. I take no comfort to that in 2021. When my late father graduated from Harry Medical College in 1960, it was 3%. We've only gone up 2% in that time. Um, uh, Latinos, now the fastest growing part of our population, only 5.8% uh, are uh, uh, Latinos, our physicians. Um, again, this is another aspect of how we can build a culture of health equity is again, leaning into the efforts to diversify the health professions that I know all of you are attempting at your institution, but for which Dr. Seldman has dedicated a large portion of his life uh, to do that. Uh, here it is the uh, number of uh, uh, percentages in pie graph in terms of the representation of who's in medical school. Again, uh, this, in, in the most recent years, we've gotten up to about seven, eight percent over the last, I think in 2021 progress. Um, so it's going to take more progress, obviously, 
given the, the, the huge disparity in the uh, populations uh, and the, the, the paucity of uh, Black and Latino physicians. But again, measuring it is very important, so we keep an eye on it. Um, again, just graphically in terms of Hispanic and Latino physicians, you see how far we lag uh, in the numbers. Uh, again, 5.8 for Latino, 5% for African-American physicians. So again, work to be done. Uh, a more diverse workforce leads us one step further to a culture of health equity. I know Dr. Sullivan would argue. Um, structural inequalities have been a huge issue. We now know, um, and I say that we've had to endure over the last 21 months, twin pandemics, COVID-19 and systemic racism. The discussion about systemic racism took place after the murder of George Floyd, after the um, death of uh, Breonna Taylor, after the death of Ahmaud Arbery in, in Georgia. Um, these have been racial awakenings among many of our students here. This was a protest I participated in with my students, with the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, crowd uh, that had assembled uh, to really protest uh, that racial bias impacts healthcare and our system. Um, so again, I've been very supportive of our students to give them voice to address their concerns about systemic racism and, and racial bias in policing. Uh, again, and these twin demics have highlighted a pressing need to address to help the root causes of health inequities. And it's uh, somebody once coined this fishbowl analogy that if you're if the fish are sort of swimming around in dirty water, there's no way clear uh, to uh, clear water unless you understand that we're in a fishbowl and it's cl it's cloudy and we have to sort of change the circumstances, change the water that we all exist in in terms of dealing with these twin pandemics. Now, again, remember I started at the beginning with Dr. King's quote, but many people don't know that wasn't the full quote. That if you go back into the original text where he spoke in 1966 at a, a convention of, of uh, a biracial, or uh, excuse me, a multiracial organization of, of young physicians in Chicago in 1966, the full quote is, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman, and he continues, because it often results in physical death. I see no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. So again, little known fact that that had that rest of that quote. But again, it's reflective of what we see, what we've seen over the last 21 months in terms of nonviolent protesting about racial injustice and police misconduct. Uh, in the country. So here it is from Dr. King's own words. Again, puts it in context how he would articulate that our call to action has to be creative, nonviolent, to raise the conscience of the nation to pursue a, a culture of health equity. Um, again, defining a culture of health, equitable access to quality medical care is necessary, colleagues, but we know is not sufficient to end disparities. We know that now. Uh, many of our places have outstanding quality of care, but we still in our communities still have issues. So again, it's necessary, but not sufficient. We have to do a better job of making health a shared value. We have to foster cross-sector collaborations like never before. We have to create healthier, more equitable communities. And we have to strengthen integration of, of health system services and systems. Again, work that the Association for the Academic Health Centers I know has embraced for many years. But again, it has been now called further into action because of COVID and what we've gone through over the last 21 months. Um, you know, we have to change our mindset in, an, in a sense too. Um, you know, we have to adjust our mindset, our expectations, our sense of community. We have to reinvigorate our civic engagement. Uh, we know that as a result, outcomes can be improved in physical or mental health, well-being, health equity. And here's just a simple graph of adults reporting a level of recognized influence of physical and social factors on their health. Um, and you can see the differences over time between 2015 and 2018, fairly consistent um, that again, uh, strong, moderate uh, you know, views on terms of how uh, physical and social factors in, in impact all of our health. 
And again, that's the way we, we, we generate a healthier health equitable, more equitable uh, healthcare culture in our country. Again, the foster cross-sector collaboration, many of you are doing it at your institutions. We're doing it here in Brooklyn with many partners. We're doing it at the New York Academy of Medicine, uh, for which I'm uh, honored to serve as chairman of the board there. Again, the driver, numbers and quality of partnerships, uh, investments in collaborations, policies that support collaboration. You know, collaborations just don't ha happen organically, colleagues. They have to be cared for. They have to be nurtured. They have to be called for. They have to be evaluated. They have to be adjusted. They sometimes have to end and new collaborations uh, begin anew. So it's stronger cross-sector uh, uh, relationships uh, uh, can, can, again, move the needle in terms of how we think about improving our health equity. Community engagement, patient-centeredness, shared aims of the patient and communities and the health givers and communities, and creating authentic he healing relationships can be the way that we enhance cross-sector modeling across our systems. Again, uh, creating uh, healthier communities, again, the drivers, we've all seen this before, but again, just a graphical. Uh, it's individual knowledge, sure. Uh, we do that very well at our places in terms of, of educating and training physicians, dentists, PAs, occupational therapists, nurses, healthcare researchers, biomedical scientists. But it also takes interpersonal, uh, it takes community, it takes organizational, and it takes a policy environment where we are in, involved at the state, local, and national level to advance greater health equity, to get to uh, get down to the social determinants of health, and again, improve the health of all Americans. Um, again, drivers, access to care, balance and integration, looking at the consumer experience and quality because uh, mi minority Americans have a, a different experience, consumer experience, than other Americans. They also have different quality experiences as well. So again, these are, again, the clear imperatives that we have to, to pursue and embrace in order to get to a health ec more equitable health culture. Again, these drivers we've all seen. Um, again, a culture of health equity requires a commitment to being a learning health system. I think we've all embraced that notion to become and lead learning health systems at AAHC. But it's an iterative cycle. It's not just static. It, you have to detect, you have to understand, you have to intervene. You have to make those critical investments in data, informatics, system science, performance improvement. Again, detecting, understanding, reducing are critical components of how we can get to a culture of, of health equity. I was recently uh, very honored to serve on the Commonwealth Fund's uh, uh, blue ribbon panel on phys physician payment and delivery system reform. We issued this report, unfortunately, right as COVID was taking shape, but this was a fantastic seminal piece of work uh, led by Greg uh, Sherman at uh, Mass General under David Blumenthal's uh, tremendous leadership at the Commonwealth Fund. But uh, we put out a report advancing health equity in healthcare because we knew it wasn't just about physician payment. It had to do more with how physician payment strategies and reform of how we pay and, and organize and fund healthcare was just one aspect of how we can get there. That unless you got racial equity right, it didn't matter what we were gonna do in terms of physician payment or health system for reform or delivery system reform. That advancing racial equity in healthcare had to be front and center in what we do as a nation as we work on those two problems. And we issued uh, six uh, very simple, uh, excuse me, five very simple uh, sort of subparts in terms of what we should do to advance health equity in the context of delivery system reform. First, require that data is stratified by race and ethnicity, is collected, publicly reported, and used. Uh, we are still stunned to the level of how lack of data we have about race, ethnicity with regards to health, uh, health uh, even to this day. Second, develop, test, and scale payment and delivery models to reduce health disparities by race and ethnicity. Test, develop, scale payment to, put money on the table to help drive reductions in health disparities. Encourage health systems to confront 
racism in their policies and programs, as well as to meaningfully engage and empower communities they serve, not just talk to the community, but really engage the communities. And we've been trying this for 40 years with variable success. But again, the moment is in this period of racial awakening or reckoning in the nation, we now see that this is even more of an imperative, imperative to double down on. Expand, diversify, and train healthcare workforce. Assess and develop protections against racial bias in healthcare technology. A huge issue, I think. Will the genomic medicine movement worsen or improve healthcare disparities? Will electronic data and artificial intelligence and all the new fangled tools that are suffusing our work as healthcare providers, will that worsen or improve healthcare disparities? That all this investment in technology has to be done so that racial bias in healthcare is not yet another byproduct of the rush for these new technologies and, and ideas and initiatives to take care of patients and communities. So again, this is why our great uh, leader, Lou Sullivan, and our tremendous president CEO of AHC joined together to bring the Sullivan Alliance into the AAHC, where I think it rightfully belongs, working with all of us who care deeply about academic health science centers and the great work that we all do in our communities all over this nation to get to a healthier culture of health equity. Thank you very much. Wow, uh, thank you, Wayne. That was a very powerful presentation. And I know that uh, the entire audience is very grateful. And uh, I'm really grateful that we've recorded it so that we can share it with our uh, colleagues and with our learners. And I'm also absolutely sure that your mentor, uh, Lou Sullivan, must be extremely proud today. With the uh, limited time we have, I, I wish we had the rest of the day to, uh, to talk. I'd like to drill down in just one or two areas and then ask you some real big picture things that you are uniquely positioned to, uh, to help us with. Um, as you know, our membership, our audience is made up of leaders of academic health centers uh, in the States and around the global village. And I'd like to go back to that horrific slide you showed uh, where all the progress we're making in closing the gap uh, got blown up. Uh, because of this horrible pandemic. As we look towards, as we pray for coming out of the pandemic into the new normal, what is your advice to folks who are leaders in academic health centers as to the most effective way to pick up the steam and start going back? If, if there were only one or two things that each of us should keep in our heads uh, each day with every committee meeting to really get back to where we were going, what would be your advice? Oh, Steve, that's a high hard one, as we say in baseball, but I'll give it a whack. <laughs> um, you know, I, you know, off the top of my head, uh, Steve, um, again, you know, yes, all of us, uh, and I know I have many friends who are members of uh, AHC and, and colleagues, and, and uh, you know, we all struggle with the same issues. Uh, you know, here I run a very storied academic health science center that is part of the largest state university system in the country in a very political state. Um, that brings a level of complexity uh, to my work and our work in Brooklyn that uh, is different than what I experienced when I was president of Meharry. Um, but again, all of us can sort of lean into this in a way with our teams and say, look, you know, COVID is here. It's never going away. It'll go sort of more dormant, but we gotta be ready for the next, um, you know, whatever. And again, you know, measurement. One of the things I truly believe we have done with variable success, Steve, is the objective data. People have a lot of opinions about what we can do to address, for example, a drop in life expectancy. Well, let's look at the data, embrace the data. Hire people who are data scientists. Um, you know, I've been intentional about beefing up uh, some of our expertise in our School of Public Health on data science, because I think you, you can make better public health policy and you can talk to your governors and your legislators and your council members with better data. And data, you know, you know, the old famous Daniel 
Pat Patrick Moynihan quote, you know, everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but there's one set of facts. <laughs> Unfortunately, that wasn't true over the last four years, uh, you know, under the prior federal administration. But we get, still got to remind people that is operative, <laughs> even in our places that, you know, people come to me at all, you know, well, show me the data. Will this move the needle? Will this decrease the number of, of Black mothers dying or hemorrhaging postpartum? Will this increase low birth weight babies? Will this get diabetes, diabetics better under control? And over time, you can get to that point. So again, Steve, just at the top of my head, be rigorous about the data. Excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, here's a, another one. Um, you, you really made an excellent point about how uh, health and healthcare is local um, and that place is so important. And those graphics were, really impressive. There is a uh, comment and a question from uh, Robert Armstrong. Um, should there not be a focus on a renewed public and population workforce? Um, are there ways in which we who occasionally can get the ear of uh, policymakers, what has been your secret sauce for so successfully getting away from an either or? and going for the end, convincing policymakers that we have to fund the underfunded public health um, workforce in the local area, not at the expense of uh, access to uh, healthcare or investments in training or research. What has been your approach to get policymakers to think outside of one box uh, and into the expanse of multiple approaches? Well, uh, Bob, it, it, thank you for that question. I, I don't claim, you know, uh, major success in this realm. Uh, uh, Dr. Armstrong's question is, is a good one. Um, but it's something, I think the analogy that I can make, many, all of us fundraise. Uh, and, you know, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone to see a potential donor and, you know, I leave empty handed, but you keep going, right? <laughs> On the 10th time, you might get the big check. And that does happen, as you know. Well, the same thing applies with legislators. You have to keep going back at them. Um, and, you know, uh, I heard uh, you were joking earlier before we joined <laughs> Bob, that uh, things were well in Wisconsin because the legislature is not in session. Um, well, when the legislature is in session, I know as good a dean as you are, you're down there. You're talking to them. You're walking the halls like I do in Albany. Um, and, you know, and, and we all have to do this in our various state capitals, whether we're in a, a private ed, higher ed or even uh, publicly supported higher ed in terms of health care. So just keep going to them. Um, some, like I said, it's, it's very much to raising money. I, I can't tell you, I've gone to a state senator four or five times and, you know, she blew me off three or four times, you know, fifth time. Oh, Dr. Riley, I, I remembered what you told me. I knew it was sinking in. Um, and then soon we did get some traction in trying to beef up some of the programs that we think can be helpful to population health improvement in, in New York City and New York State. So have at it. You got to play the long game, unfortunately, in our business. Yeah. Um, rarely do you get a home run at your first you know, swing at the bat. Um, you know, you got to hit a single. Again, it's baseball season. We're getting to October. Um, you know, hit a single. If you got to bunt the ball, get, get to the first base, bunt the ball. Um, and over time, you're going you're gonna to get around the bases and get to some of the population health specific things we all know need happen. Now, in terms of a macro answer, I think one of the great reforms in undergraduate education in the health professions has been the growth of undergraduate bachelor's level public health programs. Hmm. I think those are terrific. Uh, we need to turbocharge that. And uh, particularly in the state systems where they have more latitude to do this. Um, you know, training a young man or woman who is interested in health, not sure they want to go to medical school, not sure they want to go to nursing school, but they're interested in public health and they're interested in doing something now. We need to tap into that energy by creating more opportunities at the bachelor's and maybe even at the associate levels for students to get involved in population health work. Again, it helps us all to have that cadre of people who we can, we can hire, train, further develop in terms of additional degrees, um, you know, to work on these population health challenges that, that I just talked about. Thank you. Uh, I 
I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, sure. Here's one I'm dying to ask. Um, clearly, you have learned well from your mentor, Lou Sullivan, and, and others. And I know that there is a whole generation uh, that's looking to you as uh, their, their mentor. What is the best advice, if you had one or two nuggets, to give the next generation who sees all the progress that Lou pioneered and that you're pioneering? And we know that we're not going to finish this journey during our careers. So what would be the best advice you could give to a bright first-year medical student, or more importantly, a bright college student who, as you said, is interested in public health, isn't sure whether they're going to go nursing, dentistry. What would be your elevator speech moment to uh, really inspire them to try to uh, take the baton and move it forward? Well, Dean, you know, I, I believe in mentoring. I would not be where I am in this wonderful opportunity of a lifetime. I've had to lead two academic health science centers working for um, you know, become president of the American College of Physicians. I could not have done any of that without mentorship. Mentorship and sponsorship. And Lou is a master mentor and sponsor. I can't tell you the number of times Lou would call me over my career and said, Wayne, um, had you thought about this? Or I'm recommending you for this, Wayne. Um, and I said, Lou, why me? Well, I think you're ready. Um, that's what we all have to do, by the way. Particularly, colleagues, your black and brown student, students need it even more. And I'm very intentional at, at Downstate. I, you know, I still have students. I've been, I left Meharry in 2013. I still have Meharry students calling me for career advice. I love doing that. And that means I connected with those kids back when they were students and they still seek me seek me out here in Brooklyn for career personal advice. That is what we need to strengthen our, our cadre of, of all health professionals is be intentional about mentoring. Um, I, I mentor folks from high school level all the way you know, into postgraduate uh, years. Um, I'm very intentional about that, Bob. I think that makes a difference. And I sponsor people just like Lou sponsored me and others have sponsored me along the career, is that you have, look, mentoring is an active, engaged process. And, um, you know, it's almost like, Bob, you and I are both fellow Yaleys. It's almost like being tapped, you know, <laughs> being tapped in the Ivy League as you've been, you know, tapped to do something or join a certain organization. We have to do that in healthcare too. Tap your black and brown students, your women, of high achievement who, who need that boost from you in order to advance their career because you know they're good. You know they'll do the work. You know they'll understand health disparities. You know they'll do the right thing. And so that to me is the secret sauce that I love doing. Even, even though I got you know 5,000 employees and 2,500 students and a billion dollar budget, focus on the mentoring. The mentoring makes a difference in the lives of those who come behind us because I know darn well, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am now had it not been for mentorship and sponsorship. Wow, well, again, thank you so much, uh, Wayne. Now, before we end this session, uh, we are eager to announce that Dr. Riley will receive the Sullivan Medal in honor of this wonderful presentation. Whoa, no the, one told uh, me that. <laughs> yeah, we actually have a uh, rendering of the Sullivan oh Medal. Gosh. <laughs> that we're going to share virtually. Oh my and gosh, that is wonderful. Isn't that great? I know it'll be especially meaningful for, uh, for you, as it would be for anybody, but especially for uh, you. And as they say on late night infomercials, but wait, there's more. Uh, <laughs> we will present a separate medal to Dr. Sullivan in recognition of his presentation of the wonderful inaugural lecture that took place at last year's uh, meeting. And the AAAC will present the actual medals at an upcoming in-person event. So uh, Dr. Riley, uh, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful, wonderful, inspiring presentation and discussion. Thank you especially for your national and local leadership uh, every day. Uh, we're really uh, blessed uh, to have you as a leader and as a colleague. And uh, now I have the uh, honor, all good things must come to a close. I have the honor to pass it on to um, 
uh, Dr. Uh, Deb uh, Gurman, uh, who is the Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the College of Medicine at the University of Central Florida, as we transition from this wonderful session to the next. Thanks a lot, Wayne. Great, thank you. Well, thank you everyone. Um, and thank you, Dr. Golden. And thank you, uh, Dr. Riley for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, David. So, it, it was great. Um, I now have the privilege of facilitating a panel session that is entitled, Our Finest Hour, Academic Health Centers Rapidly Transform Research, Education, and Patient Care to meet the challenges of the pandemic. We've all transitioned our operations in every mission during this pandemic. And today we will hear about these transitions from colleagues around the world. We know that, it, uh, that we will face new challenges in our future. So today we have the opportunity to learn from each other to better prepare us for